Hello, everyone. I'm Ben. Hey, Ben. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to Read It Again Bookstore's latest live author event. Today, we are talking with Roger Johns. Roger wrote a couple of mystery novels, Dark River Rising and River of Secrets. They comprise the two, so far, Wallace Hartman mystery novels. Hi, Roger. <laughs> hey, Ben. Thanks for having me on. Good to be with you. Thanks for coming. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, well, I'll start by saying that you and I have something in common, and that is we're both from Louisiana, and we have both lived in Baton Rouge, which is the setting for both of my books. Uh, I'm not a Baton Rouge native. I grew up in the middle of the state in a little town called Alexandria, uh, which is a geographical oddity because uh, most people are familiar with South Louisiana, the sort of let the good times roll vibe down there. Uh, but they don't know that the northern part of uh, Louisiana is a little bit uh, straight-laced and uh, quite the opposite. And I grew up in a town that was literally on the borderline between the straight-laced north and the good times south, and we didn't know what to be. So <laughs> whatever defects there are in my personality, I attribute it to the fact that I grew up in Alexandria, which is otherwise a nice place. I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I came to writing late in life. I was uh, a long time ago a corporate lawyer. Then I spent decades as a college professor. Uh, I did lots of other things along the way. I took a detour to go try my hand at writing sitcoms in Hollywood. That was an awful failure, but I learned a lot. I made some good friends and I'm still friends with those people today. Uh, I was a late in life med school dropout. Uh, which was another, you know, miserable experience, but I learned a lot and I had fun doing it. Um, and uh, after I retired, this idea that came to me while I was headed to class one day about uh, the cocaine industry, the illegal cocaine industry, uh, took hold and took root. And I spent uh, a few years working that out. And that was the idea that became Dark River Rising. And uh, in the last few months, I've been writing a lot of short stories. Uh, the first one came out in this book. Let's see, there we go. It's uh, a collection of short stories and essays about uh, being alone together in Georgia during the pandemic. And you can see the cover. There's that little bit of a medieval thing and all of the people have got masks on now. Nice. Uh, and I've got a new one that just came out recently in uh, Dark City. Uh, and it's a, a story of revenge. For some reason, I've discovered that revenge tales hold a lot of interest for me. And you can get really creative. And if you spill a little blood, which always happens in murder mysteries, but if you do, you can, you can feel a bit justified in doing it. So I'm having a blast doing that. Remind me never to get on your bad side. <laughs> People say that all the time. Yeah. Awesome. Well, congratulations on the success of your books and short stories published in the different magazines and anthologies so far. Thank you. I, I read both the mystery books. I really enjoyed them. I'm not a mystery reader. If I had to pick, uh, I'm usually sticking with other genres, sci-fi, fantasy, typically. But when I had the chance to read books about my hometown since I'm from Baton Rouge. I'm like, got to jump on it. And I really enjoyed them. So congratulations. Thank you. Everybody that writes books set in Louisiana, they put them in New Orleans because it's the most famous city. But I love Baton Rouge of all the places in the state and of all the places I've ever lived. It's still my absolute favorite. And I, I'm on a one-man crusade to bring the respect it deserves to Baton Rouge. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you for doing that on behalf of Baton Rougeans everywhere all around the world. <laughs> i tell you what, why don't we do a reading from one of your books? And by we, I mean, of course, you. I think you've prepared a passage, one of your fan favorite passages from one of your books. We'd love to hear a little bit about the Wallace Hartman mysteries. Okay. Uh, this is... Uh... 
it's about two pages. And uh, for all the Catholics in the audience, I apologize uh, because I'm going to be a little bit lighthearted with things. But as it turns out, my main character, Wallace Hartman, who is a, a homicide detective in Baton Rouge, she was raised in a Catholic family and her brother is a Catholic priest. And South Louisiana still today is a very largely Catholic area. So I thought that I needed to do a lot of things to get some information out on the page. And I wanted to do it in a way that I thought uh, might be humorous rather than just uh, feeding things out there, what they call an info dump in the writing world. So this takes place in church. It was dim and quiet inside the church with that middle of the week empty feeling. Fresco saints glared down from the vaulted ceiling and the vague scent of old incense laced the air. Faint sounds produced solemn echoes as a young man emerged from the confessional with his head hung reverentially low. Wallace took his place in the penitent stall. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been at least three popes since my last confession. Wallace, you have to stop doing this, the priest scolded without conviction. Well, maybe I've sinned and I need forgiveness, she teased. I'm certain you have and that you do, but I'm your little brother. If this confession is as impure as your last one, I'll have to go to confession myself just for listening to it. Oh, come on, Lex. Aren't you supposed to give me absolution before you dish out the grief? Well, aren't you supposed to actually confess your sins first? Well, I don't want to scandalize you. What if we just go through them by commandment number? You know, I could say that I violated the third commandment three times and I rang up one number four and a couple of sixes and so on. Well, I'm on a tight schedule, so why don't you just add them up and give me the total? But without some detail, how will you know if I'm being truthful and whether I'm truly sorry? Good point. Are you really here for confession or is this something else? Something else, she confessed. I just haven't seen you for a while, that's all. Lex and Wallace and their older brother Martin had been those storybook siblings parents dreamt about. Adult life took them in different directions, but they still had seen each other often and spoke almost daily. Martin's death ended that. What were once naturally and frequently intersecting orbits came to require effort after Martin was killed. The fact that it took effort made Wallace and Lex self-conscious. Somehow neither had noticed until he was gone that Martin was the linchpin in the trio. Now they went long periods without contact. Eventually guilt would trump self-consciousness and one of them would call the other. They would make plans to get together and sometimes they followed through. You know, Father Rudansky from Texarkana, we went to seminary together. He's passing through Baton Rouge tomorrow on the way to visit his father. He's stopping by for lunch. Why don't you join us? Oh, gee, that sounds like a class reunion, Wallace said. I don't know. I don't want to get in the way. Uh, and she was a bit disappointed at being offered only third wheel status. On second thought, she backtracked. That sounds fine. The presence of the other priest might keep things lively. What time? Oh, come by around 11. When Wallace didn't respond, Lex pushed. I can tell there's something else on your mind. It's nothing, she said, unsure if she was ready to expose her feelings. Does this nothing have a name? Mason, but it's not what you think. I'm not thinking anything, Lex said. And in any event, what you think is all that's important. I don't know what I think. I've got mixed emotions. I'm afraid he might be complicated. Are you sure you're not just still afraid, period? Lex, must you always cut straight to the heart of the matter? A quiet hum sounded from Wallace's phone. You have your phone on in confession, Lex asked. Sorry, it's my fess up online in case you had a really long line. I'll see you tomorrow, she said, as she slipped out of the confessional and darted for the side door of the church. I beg forgiveness for, for everyone who thought that was too sacrilegious. You know, you say that, but... That confession sounded really similar to some confessions I may or may not have participated in. Let's see. I've got three number ones and a couple of number four. Sure. <laughs> if only we could do it that way, right? <clears throat> it would be a lot easier if we just came with a checklist and handed it over, and then they could scan it, like, I don't know, at the grocery store, and then, you know, in and out. But Right. That would ruin. I think on the screen. that would yeah. ruin part of the. I think part of the experience. I think. <clears throat> but at any rate, uh, great reading gives Thank us you. a little bit of insight into the the main character of both your books. That was an excerpt from the first of the two books. Yes. 
And uh, in case anyone forgot about what these books were about, they are mysteries wrapped in murder or somewhere along the other way around. And right off the bat, both books start with the unfortunate demise of an individual and then Wallace is put on the case. I really enjoyed reading them and I was very surprised throughout the book how the characters that Wallace, your your heroine detective, uh, interacts with were not the the typical characters I would expect from um I don't know any any kind of book. They 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 were they were at the same time real and in some cases irreverent and in some cases lighthearted and very personable. And it was very easy to root for not only Wallace, the main heroine, but the other you know, protagonists. And uh, it was also very easy to uh, you know boo <laughs> the bad guys. So, but then in some cases it wasn't quite so clear who was the good and who were the bad guys. So that was also, I think, very well yeah. done. So just like life. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, I worked very hard on the characters, uh, and the main character Wallace is an important personality to me. Well, let me ask you one more question before we take a little bit of a diversion from the straight Q and A. <clears throat> Sure. So you said that you uh, were born in Alexandria, spent about a decade in Baton Rouge. So what do you miss about Baton Rouge? And did writing these books help you reconnect with that best decade of your life? <laughs> well, yes, it did help me uh, uh, reconnect with that. The people in Baton Rouge were wonderful. I went to college there and made a lot of friends, some of which I still have. I worked there uh, in between college and law school and had the most transformative experiences of my life uh, during that period of work. Then I went to law school and then I worked briefly for a small law firm in Baton Rouge after law school. And then I moved to Lafayette where uh, I became, uh, where I spent most of the time of my uh, law practice. But Baton Rouge is, the place where I went through this enormous personal metamorphosis. And because of that, uh, it remains not only a favorite place, but probably the most important place for me personally. And it happened because of a job I got. Most people don't know uh, in Baton Rouge, it's two cities, North Baton Rouge and South Baton Rouge. And the dividing line is where the Capitol building is. Some people would say, well, it's Florida Boulevard, but it's not. It's right where, the, oddly enough, it's where the Capitol is. And the South part is very leafy and green and very wealthy and peaceful. And the North part uh, is very industrial and very dangerous. And in my work experience, it was, and may still be, I don't know, but it was a very violent part of town. Uh, and the men that I worked with did very dangerous work and they were very dangerous people. So I would go to work and be around all of this constant violence and threat of violence and these very tough guys uh, dealing with each other on a basis day by day. And then at night I would go home to this very peaceful, idyllic part of the town and they could not have been more different. The people, the places, the things that went on, the things that were important to people could not have been more different. And that was the first time in my life when I really got an up close look at the fact that people don't, not everybody lives the kind of life that I live and not everybody's fortunes are gonna be tied to the same things that mine are tied to. And I better get on with learning about this and making this part of who I am, because this feels very, very real to me. That's a great, a great uh, geographic and historical perspective on on Baton Rouge. I grew up, I guess you would call it in the south part, although I always th thought it was the east part of the south part, I suppose. And my wife always kids me because when she moved to Baton Rouge, she asked me, oh, how do I get here? And how do I get there? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I like, well, you live there all your life. And I said, yeah, but I live two blocks off one road. And I went this many miles to church. And on this other direction, I went this many miles to school. And then it was two blocks to the mall. I didn't have to go yeah. anywhere else. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I know there's a whole larger city out there. And of course, when you, when you read, when you turn on the news, you read the newspaper, but all the 
the different things that are happening that aren't in your idyllic, like you said, neighborhood, it makes you realize that Baton Rouge as a, as a, as a city is so much bigger than that one road that I went down every day to either school or the other direction to church and right <laughs> the mall right. just a couple blocks away. So it was, it's a great, it's a great uh, thing to point out that, you know, even people living in the same town can have a completely different experience just sure. based on where you happen to be living. So. And when it came time to write these books, I, the only thing about them that didn't change was the setting. And it was because I couldn't think of a better place to put uh, stories about very dangerous events than a place like Baton Rouge, where part of it is safe and part of it is deadly dangerous. And part of it, you just don't know. It's a crapshoot. Yep. All right. Well, that was a pretty intense uh, question and answer. So why don't we do something a little bit lighthearted? And for that, I'm going to ask <clears throat> the owner of Read It Again Books to join us for a little game we like to call... How do you pronounce that? <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, so we've prepared uh, welcome Kim to our our interview with Roger. We was around. There we go. All right. So what we've done is we've prepared a few words, some from Baton Rouge and some from other parts of Louisiana, and we're going to ask Kim, who is not a Louisiana native, to try to and pronounce he's electric, them. And so really can't read. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Okay, All right. So first one that should be uh, well, we'll start with an easy one. Why don't we start with the one that we've already mentioned several times? How do you pronounce that, Kim? Baton Rouge. Correct. <laughs> Congratulations. All right. All right. Now for the uh, the round two, the difficult one. Wait, wait, one. wait. You, you mentioned beforehand that there was a different way to pronounce that. Well, it's uh, Baton Rouge is actually a a French phrase or a French word. Mm -hmm. Baton is stick and rouge is red and the historical legend there you go <laughs> the historical legend is, is when the the people who eventually named what became baton rouge first uh were exploring it and i when i and, and by we and they i mean the non-native peoples who were exploring it mm -hmm. they saw all these red colored sticks or stabs in the ground and they were French, and so they said, oh, 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 rouge baton, and that's how they named the area. And I think they were actually Indian burial sticks, so oh, no. that's how Baton Rouge got its name. All right, so good job. You got one point. Let's try another one. Tonsillitis. <laughs> <laughs> that is incorrect, but it was a good try. Roger, how do you pronounce this word? This is the most important street in New Orleans, and it's uh, Chapatula. And it's the name of a native tribe in South Louisiana. Wait, wait, wait. What was that again? Snopatulus. Shopatulus. Okay. Ben, what did you say that your family pronounced it as? Oh, that's the next one. <clears throat> oh. Yeah, try the next one. It's funny. We went over these, but it doesn't mean I remember them. All right. Okay, okay. I got this. Is it this one? Hold on. The suspense. Double chin. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That is incorrect. Wait, wait, wait. Actually, let me try for real. Dupa le chin. No, this is in fact a name. Roger, how do we pronounce this name? This is the most, Kim, You, I want you to feel good about yourself. This is the most <laughs> difficult Cajun last name to pronounce ever. Yeah. Dupla chin. Duplichin. I that sounds way better than <laughs> duplichin. Yes. Shop the tulips, yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. So I try the one that begins with N, Kim. N queued up. Where? Okay. Okay. Are you I got, ready? I got this one. You ready? All right. I have confidence. Okay. Nacho nachos. <laughs> try again. Okay, Nat Chin Tin Oceans. Yes. <laughs> okay, now the people, I am not doing this on purpose. I'm very dyslexic. And so reading these words out loud is, is yeah, I'm torturing myself. So well, what is it? Well, when I first learned this name, this is the name of a city in, in Louisiana, and this, I guess the northwest part of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought it was pronounced nacho cheese. 
Mm-hmm. That's not it either. Not so chitlets. <laughs> that's not that's not <laughs> it either. <laughs> Roger, how do you pronounce this city name in Louisiana? The the great city of Natchitoches. 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 That's correct. That doesn't sound French. That sounds uh, Native American. It is. <clears throat> okay. And it's well, the twin city of a Texas city called Nacogdoches. And the story is this chief had two sons and he sent them out in different directions to found different settlements. And mm-hmm. one of them was Nacogdoches and the other was Nacogdoches. Well, I, I'm, I'm large part of my family is from Long Island. We have a lot of Native American uh, towns there like Poquot and um, Hot Hot Yeah. yeah. So, okay, we got another All right, one. so uh, Kim, let's, let's do a first name, last name combo. Let's see if you can get it right. Yeah, I, I see this that you sent me. Wait, I just, okay. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> You're a good sport. Thank I you. I know. Okay. Herbert Maritinex. No, there's no team. <laughs> <laughs> you got, you're halfway there. Herbert? Yep. Okay. Marion X. Roger, help us out. How do you pronounce that name? Marion O. Oh, you know, my daughter's in right here in the living room. She said it right. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> okay, okay, here here's one. All right. This is the name of a city not too far from Baton Rouge, just across the river, in fact, from Baton Rouge. Point coupe. Like like a car. It's like a Point coupe. <laughs> it's close. Okay. That's how it should be pronounced, actually. Oh. <laughs> and it's one of the few French names that we get wrong in Louisiana, and we just call it, it looks, point coupe. Point coupe. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what oh. else we do. Here. Do we have uh, any other ones that I, I need I think, to do? I think, we ran out of, I think we ran out of words, but Kim, Word. we have a lovely prize for you for playing our game today. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just said that. What's Beignets. What's there you go. <laughs> okay, so my there. lovely wife, Stacy, points out she wants to know why H-E-R-B-E-R-T is not pronounced a bear. Well, there's actually two names very close together. If you have two R's, it's Herbert. But if you take out the first R, it's a bear. So there you go. And this is the name of the character in the second book. So whether or not we pronounce it correctly, Roger is the authoritative source because this is a character from his novel, and he said it was Herbert Mariano. Right. Okay. Two R's. Two R's. That's right. All right, guys. I'm going to head out now. Back. All right. Well, thanks for playing. And uh, <clears throat> oh. There I am. <laughs> Let me try that again. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. So, Roger. Yes, sir. You talked about the state capitol building being yes. the dividing center between, or the dividing line between North and South Baton Rouge. Yes, there, there it is, is featured on the cover of the second book. Did you ever get a chance to visit the state capitol when you lived in Baton Rouge? Oh, yes. I used to work in the state capitol. Okay. Uh, my first uh, job out of college and the job I had while I was in the last several months of my senior year, I worked for the legislative council. Uh, so I saw the whole building, everything. Okay. And by everything, I assume you also mean you saw the bullet holes that are still in the wall left over from the assassination from Louisiana's governor. Back yes. in the day, Huey Long. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> when I was reading the second book, particularly more so than the first, the first book is about the, like you were talking about the, an illegal cocaine industry that uh, the main detective is trying to sort out and squash. But the second book gets more into, I think, some of the more seedy past of Baton Rouge and Louisiana politics, where you have a lot of corrupt politicians you have a lot of politicians who are trying to distance themselves from their corrupt or poor choices from their past. Yes. And then you have a lot of uh, characters who would be considered as white supremacists or racists yes. or it's all of the above. Yeah, 
So what I wanted to know is, um, <clears throat> did the actual political climate of our country, and of course, Louisiana's past, influence some of the themes uh, that you were trying to work into your book? Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that. Well, well yes. yes. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about this story and a lot of time thinking about this book. It actually was frightening to write this book because it touched on so many issues that are causing so much grief for so many people. Uh, but I wanted to make a story that showed the possibility of hope at the end of this nasty bit of corruption and uh, exposing this ugly vein of racism uh, in certain parts of Louisiana and certain mindsets that go along with it. I have talked to lots of people over the months and years since this book came out, and I wanted, to, you know, a lot of them said, you know, that's not really Louisiana. And I said, well, actually, it is Louisiana. You may not want to think of it that way, but there are those people there. Uh, but it's not all of Louisiana. There are a lot of good people, a great many good people in Louisiana. And uh, for a lot of people, it's swimming against an old tide. And that was the thing that I wanted to bring out was that this is an inflection point for our country and an inflection point for the state of Louisiana, where people are finding ways to break away from uh, a past that didn't serve anyone uh, and that there are avenues of hope that these things, these matters of race and class and corrupt politics, while they have plagued humanity since the dawn of humanity and will be with us always, there are avenues by which we can break away from them and make life better, but it's a struggle and it's going to be hard and you're going to encounter people that you think are one thing and turn out to be another. Uh, people that you think are good who turn out to be bad and people who are bad that turn out to be you think are bad but turn out to be good and it was a very difficult book to write from that perspective well you're spot on with my take on that same book i think we mentioned this at the beginning of the interview how there's certain characters especially in the second book that i thought were going to be good all the way through and then they start revealing either their past or their present bad side and then there are some characters that I thought right away, well, that's that was a bad guy. And then you find out maybe he wasn't so bad after all. And so it's, and it's, <clears throat> I'm sure it was as nearly difficult for me reading about it as it was writing it for you. But having grown up there and knowing that even though this is fiction, it's it's based on real opinions and politics yeah. of, of that state and, and that city. Um, but again, I, I really enjoyed it, and I, I appreciate you bringing that to light in a way that that made it digestible, putting it into a, a, a good old-fashioned murder mystery with um, the you know real politics and and uh, stereotypes and and racism of of reality blended into a fictional story. So, well Thank done. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it, even though it was difficult and a bit scary. Well, maybe this next question then might not have a very uh, <clears throat> happy answer, but given how hard it was for you to write the second book, is there going to be a third book in the Wallace Hartman mystery series? Well, I'm praying. I hope so. I've written the vast majority of books two and three, but uh, if they do come out, they will be with a different publisher because the company that published the first two uh, canceled the series after the second book. But my agent has a lot of faith in this character and the series, so she's trying to sell the series to another publisher now. Oh, well, best of luck on that. I I would love to read more about, especially <clears throat> the, the relationships that Wallace develops across the first two books, specifically the, the one relationship uh, that she develops in the first book that carries over into the second one. Yeah. I just feel like there's got to be more to that story. So I, I hope you do find a publisher well, for the next. There is. And, you know, sometimes people will say, well, which book is your favorite book? And that's sort of like saying, which child is your favorite <laughs> child? Um, you're not supposed to answer that in public. But uh, my first book will always be special because it was the first. 
But I have to say the third book, just in terms of the story and what happens to the characters, uh, is my favorite by a lot. So oh, okay. I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this one will come out. Okay, awesome. Well, me too. And as far as your, your, your tough moral decision about deciding which book is your favorite, I'm going to give you some advice that my grandmother gave to me <clears throat> when we would ask her, well, which one of us is your favorite grandchild? <laughs> and, she said, and she says, I love the one the most that I'm with. So it was a very evasive but true answer. So wow. love, you, love you, you, she was a lawyer? <laughs> no, she wasn't. <laughs> but she was very, very uh, diplomatic, I suppose. Could have been very. a good lawyer. Yes. Awesome. All right. Well, here's another question for you. Both book titles refer to a river, yes. presumably the Mississippi River. Mm. What is your connection to the river and why did you choose to name the books after it? That's a thank you. That's a very good question. And just so you know, Ben, spending 20 years as an academic, I fell in love with the sound of my own voice. So <laughs> you're asking me things where I could talk your ear off so when you're <laughs> done listening and you you've heard enough just you know i'll give you a secret signal <laughs> yeah, cut, me off, cut me off the first book uh the the word river obviously refers to the to the mississippi river which is that behemoth of a river uh that runs through the middle of our country and by the time it gets to baton rouge it's nearly a mile wide and it's huge and if you look at a map of the that part of Louisiana, you'll find that as it has gotten closer and closer to the Gulf of Mexico, the land has gotten flatter and flatter. So there's less slope to keep it in its banks. And over the years and the eons, it has frequently jumped its banks, wiping out everything in its path. And that is still a possibility today. I mean, the, the river has been levied up and levied up and levied up. But the fact is the bottom of the river is now higher than the surrounding land in lots of places that's outside the levee. So if, if it should ever breach, uh, especially in Baton Rouge, it would be a horrible, horrible thing. Um, so there's that worrisome thing about the river itself that is always haunting Baton Rouge. But in the first book, it deals a lot with the drug trade. And so I was thinking of this constant river of cocaine coming into Louisiana. And there are so many avenues along that coastline for this to come in. And one of the main characters in the book is a DEA agent who is an expert at analyzing information, huge quantities of information, rivers of information. And this, these rivers of information are often revealing dark secrets. So the word river there referred to the river itself, to the river of drugs, to the river of information. And in the second book, I carried the yes. And uh, my editor at the time suggested adding the word rising because um, <clears throat> this is the original title of the book. This is mm. an early version of it. It was just called Dark River. She said, well, let's add the word rising to it because that makes it sound like something dangerous is about to happen. And, you know, that's, that's what these people get paid for coming up. <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. Uh, and in the second book, uh, everyone, every major person in the book has a secret. And it's, yes, and it's not what you think it is. And it turns this world completely upside down for a while. Um, the books three and four, which are nearly complete and don't have a home yet, are River of Madness. And uh, that's that's going to be uh, book three is River of Madness. And there will be uh, a river in the fourth one. I haven't quite decided what I want to call it yet. But it's uh, the third book is about the human trafficking trade. Okay. Wow. So you're definitely <clears throat> tackling more gritty and intense subjects with each, each of these books. Yeah. Well, presumably between books, your heroine is finding other things to do that aren't maybe so deadly and terrible, then she can enjoy some of her life. But mm -hmm. uh, presumably she will have a rough time of it in each of the books. <laughs> that's what that's what heroines do. <laughs> yes. Um, it's, uh, you, you push them to the limit and then push them a little harder. Uh, but that is the essence of this woman, uh, this character, Wallace Hartman, 
is that when the chips are down and when things are the most hopeless, she's the one who figures out more quickly than anyone else where the avenue of salvation lies and how to get there. Well, in addition to her being uh, a brilliant solver of of crime cases, figuring things out, <clears throat> there were several passages in, in both of these books where I just had to stop and kind of just kind of smack my lips after reading such a, a tasty sentence. And it just helped us to really visualize and, and see and even emotionally connect with her in a way that I wasn't expecting. And I, and I have just one paragraph I want to read. Please. Two, sen two sentences. This is from <clears throat> River of Secrets, the second book. And I'm not going to even give you the context because I'm not even sure that it, it is lessened, taken out of context. So here it is. And this is referring to uh, the main character, Wallace. She missed him when they were apart. And now she was starting to miss him even when they were in the same room with each other. This was going to be harder than she thought. And I just thought, oh, wow, it got me. I'm just yeah. thinking about different relationships that I have of, of being in the same room with people and feeling distant. And perhaps we're all feeling a little bit of that with the pandemic being, for the most part, a lot of us are stuck at home or, or forced to be at home mm -hmm. or, or choose to be at home to, to be safer. Yeah. And you know, personal relationships have taken on a whole new dimension. People yes, in your family yeah. are not just there to greet you when you get home from work and see you off when you leave from work. You know, they're there 24 seven with you. Yes. And I think we're all learning something new about each other. And that, and that passage really connected with me in this time because, um, well, everything I just said. So a uh, br brilliant uh, way to describe something that just would connect at least with this one reader and presumably a lot of other readers. And and then there were lots of other examples of that kind of, you know, where I had to just pause and realize, wow, this, that just spoke to me uh, as if, if it, as if it were, you know, me thinking that, although I hadn't really thought it before. So. Well, uh, I know it's going to sound like I have a disorder, but these characters become very real to me. Uh, as I'm working on them, uh, and they are never very far from me. Um, you know, I'll be driving, and my wife will talk to me and say, "What? Uh, <laughs> who are you again?" Uh, because you get so involved with their lives, it's uh, uh, it's as if they are people you know. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, there's a good question. Uh, this comes from E. McKnight. He wants to know. Oh, and the question's gone. Can you put that back on the screen, please? <laughs> there it is. The question is, what does your writing schedule look like? Well, now that we're home, and I'm I'm retired, uh, I no longer uh, work as an academic, so I consider myself a full-time house husband and a part-time writer. And once I'm finished with my chores for the day and I've read the paper on my phone, I get down to business and I write for a few hours in the morning. Uh, then I have lunch with my wife and then I write for a few more hours and then we have dinner. Sometimes we go out, which we can do in Douglasville because uh, restaurants here are still open for the most part. Uh, and then uh, I do a lot of reading in the, in the evenings, things uh, uh, written by people whose technique I admire and I'm trying to learn something from them. And if I'm feeling really motivated for the last two or three hours of the day, I'll go back to the keyboard and start writing. But by then, I'm so tired that uh, it's hard to, to sometimes get things the way I want them to. So I find myself sketching more in the evening and getting down to the real business of finalizing words earlier in the day on the following day. Well, that's great that you're able to capitalize on all times of day to, to make progress. I think if I were tired in the evening, I'd be like, you know what? I just going to not do anything tonight, but you found a way to at least uh, you know, make progress on your books. And here's another question. This comes from Shannon Gold. And this maybe ties in perfectly with what we were just talking about. Yeah. How do you find the motivation to write, especially when you're just feeling tired or not mentally having the right words to put on paper? 
You know, well, these are both great questions and I, and I love them both. And I love this motive question because it's the hardest one for so many people to deal with. Uh, and I have to say that when I was writing the first book, there were days when I just didn't want to get near it again because I was afraid of it or I was frustrated by it. But once I had latched on to who this character, Wallace Hartman, really was, I became so enchanted with her and so mesmerized by her and the things that she was having to go through that I couldn't wait to spend more time with her. And the character started out as a male and uh, it wasn't working. So eventually the little voice in my head said, make it a, a woman. And I did. And that was the thing that changed it all for me is that I fell in love with these characters. Uh, Wallace, uh, her mentor, who is part of that scene that you just read from, a guy named Colly Greenberg, who was her first partner and her still her mentor. Uh, I became so compelled by these characters that I just can't wait to get back. Uh, yes, yeah, she does, Sam. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask. My wife is a constant <laughs> source of uh, inspiration to me, and she is, you know, that that foot on the backside for days when I'm feeling lonely or uh, sad because I'm not getting the work done. She is, and she has a huge, very important job. Uh, and it's very stressful and it keeps her occupied all the time. But she is there to make sure that I'm getting the job done because she knows that above everything else in my life, I am lazy to the core. And if there's not somebody back there <laughs> kicking, I'm liable to just get on the couch and that's it. Oh, well, you admitted it on camera, so now everyone knows. <laughs> hey, listen, I made out like a bandit. My wife definitely got the short end of this. <laughs> okay, so thinking about what you just said and the personal relationships that, that not only define us in reality, but the personal relationships that are that are in the book for the characters that you've invented, that you've written about, one might think, well, this this books is just about these these personal relationships, but there's a lot of police procedural in these two books as well, mm -hmm. and the mix of those I think was a, a good balance. It never seemed too heavy of one or the other. We got to know the characters, but we also got to see them do doing police work. So my next question is, what was the origin, perhaps, of your love affair with writing police procedurals? Maybe other books or television shows. There's certainly a lot out there. Um, this was what you wanted to write about with these two books. So tell us about it. Well, um, and I love that question too, Shannon, and I will get to it in just a second. The thing that propelled me toward the police procedural was I needed a way to show certain things and to have a character that had certain built-in characteristics to be able to go and do things that an ordinary person couldn't do. So uh, the stories that I have inside me wouldn't work with a private investigator. Uh, they wouldn't work with some just, you know, alphabet soup government agent out there. <laughs> I needed somebody who was close to the town, close to the people, close to the situation, and close to her family, which would be living in the same town. And um, I tried a lot of different characters until I came up with female homicide detective. And that was the one that worked. And some of my favorite authors, Michael Connolly being one, writes police procedurals. And I have learned so much from reading his books over and over and over again uh, that I thought, well, I, I think I can do this. There are a lot of things I won't be able to do, but I think there is enough guidance out there in the world of published police procedurals that I can, I can I can do this. So that's what I did. And awesome. Shannon, what was that question again? <laughs> your My favorite authors, I think. Yeah, your favorite authors. Oh, yeah. Michael Connolly, <clears throat> Sue Grafton uh, is uh, probably my all-time favorite crime fiction writer. She wrote a series of books about a private investigator, Kinsey Milhone, that she kept fresh for dozens of books. And there is real magic in the ability to do that. So there are some of her books that I've read a number of times just to figure out how do you keep this character 
from getting stale in your own mind as a writer? How do you keep it fresh on the page for the reader? How do you avoid the Cabot Cove syndrome of, you know, the same person confronting the same kind of stuff over and over again? And she was an absolute genius at it. She knew her business uh, so well, and I've learned so much from her. And she's she died a few years ago, and I miss her writing terribly. Well, it's always sad when an author, speaking for myself, an author that I have read, you know, passes away because then I'm thinking there's never going to be any more books like this yeah. one that they wrote that I read. And so I kind of I cherish them a little bit more. And so, uh, you know, I totally understand what you're saying, even though I've never read any of Sue Grafton's uh, uh, writing. Uh, but speaking of writing, uh, you mentioned early on that you were being published in a magazine and some anthologies. Are these also yeah. crime uh, stories? What are these about? Well, um, the one in here is uh, called Honor Among Thieves, and it's about uh, some con men who are getting ripped off by a third party. And as they take care of business in dealing with this guy who is ripping them off, they find out that they can't trust each other either. <laughs> and these are two what? guys who work together. I know. Imagine <laughs> that. These are two guys who have worked together forever. Uh, so what happens when two people who are in the breaking trust business realize they can't trust each other? Uh, so that's what that one is about. This one in The Dark City is a revenge tale. And it's about a guy who... Uh, has been the victim of bullying all of his life. And he has been undergoing this special type of therapy called EMDR, which is eye movement. Gee, I can't even remember what it is. Hang on and I'll, I'll tell you what it stands for. I this is memory. terrible, I have to, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm just uh, trying to expand the acronym myself. Yeah, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. There you go. And wow. It's this weird thing where you go into therapy and the therapist moves his or her finger or some object back and forth in front of your eyes. And you keep your head still, but you move your eyeballs and your eyeballs moving to the periphery while you're thinking certain things will drain the trauma out of those things that you're thinking about. And it doesn't work for everybody, but for some people, it can take a traumatic event and just turn it into a lifeless image in your head. Wow. I know okay. it sounds strange. There's no drugs involved. It's just you moving your eyes back and forth, uh, being prompted to uh, go through certain thinking patterns with a skilled therapist. And people who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, people who've been the victim of crimes, uh, people who've had ugly childhoods, they go through EMDR and it works. Well, this guy who's been a victim of bullying all his life had plenty of reason to go through this therapy, but he figures out a very interesting way to misuse the therapy. Oh, okay. I was wondering where the revenge part was coming into play. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Oh, you know about it, Shannon. But yes. It does work. I have a friend who helped me get the particulars of it right because he had gone through some very traumatic uh, times. Uh, people close to him had died. Uh, a lot of people suddenly from different things all at one time. And he went through this and he it worked. So he was sort wow. of my expert on call. Okay. Uh, I, I have another one coming out uh, soon in Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine that's about these birds that um, well, they do a bad thing. I can't tell you what it is, <laughs> but uh, they're smart. They talk and uh, they they think. People wonder, well, if a bird can talk, is it just repeating something like a tape recorder or is there thought behind it? Well, um, I think there's evidence that there's real thought behind it. And I've taken it maybe a step too far, but I don't care. I enjoy <laughs> the story. That's awesome. I would love to read that. Thank you. All right. Well, I've heard a lot about the things that you know and therefore the things that you write because of course they the advice is write what you know mm -hmm. so 
Can you give us an example of something that you would like to write that you don't know, or maybe you already did with the last two couples of descriptions of short stories? Like, what would you love to write that you just don't know anything about? Maybe just throwing yourself out there just for fun, even well, if it never saw the light of day. Well, I um, while I'm hoping these uh, new Wallace Hartman books come out, I'm writing a, a standalone thriller but I'm also working up a new series about some people who work for an outfit called Tomcat. And that is a government agency that deals with cargo piracy. It's not a well-known thing, but tractor trailers, train cars, delivery trucks, oh, wow. ships okay. coming in and out. They are constantly being ripped off and people are being killed. Uh, cargo piracy is a big bad thing and it's flying under the radar. So I want to write a series of books about that and about the Tomcat agents, but I know, you know, nothing about it. <laughs> um, so I'm learning and there are actually places where you can go and learn about all this stuff. And it's just fascinating. Wow. Okay. That also sounds very thrilling. It, it just, it has, it has visions of, of, of uh, uh, Fast and Furious in my mind, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Heists on the the highway and and uh, piracy on the high seas. Awesome. Yeah. Well, well, I didn't know. I knew a lot about chemistry, and there's a little bit about cocaine chemistry in the first book, but I didn't know anything about the cocaine trade. However, um, I read this book, and I can't find it. I was looking for it right there on my shelf behind me. I can't find it, but it was a book written by a guy who studied the cocaine trade. And he went down to Colombia and Peru and met the growers and he met the drug lords and he met the mules who moved it. And he had a lot of footnotes in his book. So I could get an education on that. It was fascinating too. And I didn't have to put myself in danger, but it looks like I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that that is the, definitely the mark of a successful author if you steal. Uh, if you don't, well, no, no, I was no. going to say that. I was going to no, say that no, you don't know what you're talking Good authors, <laughs> good authors copy, great authors steal. That, oh, okay. That's, well, that's I, wasn't gonna go there. I wasn't going to go there. I was going to say, you know, it seems like it's a, another way of looking, uh, categorizing an author as good is if they convince you that they know what they're talking about when really maybe they didn't and they just did a lot of research and you know borrowed from you know, colleagues and and the research that's out there so well remember i did start life as a lawyer so i learned that <laughs> a long time ago i'm sure you were one of the good ones <laughs> i tried i tried well i'm gonna oh there we go i was just about to ask our audience if they have any final questions to throw up on the screen uh before we we conclude for the day and here shannon beat me to the punch what advice would you give to aspiring authors? And I'm sure you've heard this question a billion times, but it's you know what everyone wants to know from authors. So here's your chance to tell us your answer. It is my all-time favorite question. Oh, perfect. And yes, I, I, I have heard it a lot. I've asked it a lot. Uh, and it is my all-time favorite question. And the answer is quite simple to me. Find something that you enjoy working on and never never ever quit you don't know what you know until you're writing it don't wait for inspiration just get to the story start writing it and once you have there's something odd about seeing information on a page in front of you outside of your head that will trigger inspiration uh, it took me seven years to write that first book oh, nine wow. months to write the second one but you learn a lot in the process. And there were many times when I set it down and I'm sorry I did. There were many times I wanted to quit, uh, but you just can't. And, and if you keep going at it, uh, you will get there. And the second piece of advice I would give you is join a critique group where people know what they're doing and are willing to give you good advice and give you hard nosed advice and listen and learn from these people. And once you become friends with the people in your critique group, quit and join another one where the people don't love you so much. So they'll give you good, hard-nosed advice and you can learn something from them. Uh, I went through three of them before this book came out. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's it. Never quit. Join a critique group. Just stay at it and find something you love. 
Awesome. Awesome advice. Well, I have one final question for you. We'll get to that question in a second. Actually, no, we'll do that one first. What is your favorite restaurant in Baton Rouge? Because I know Stacy's because we used to live there uh, after we were married for a few years and we definitely had our favorite restaurant. Well, I'm going to have to say that depends. The Pastime Lounge, which is uh, down under the interstate near downtown, if you're just looking for a very casual place uh, with a po' boy. Um, and there was another restaurant. I don't think it's there anymore. It was right next door to Cottonwood Books. And I can't think of the name of it. Um, gee whiz. What kind of restaurant was it? What kind of food? Yeah, Panetta's. Oh, okay. Panetta's was the name of it. Uh, and then there's George's right there, literally under the interstate, right across the street from Panetta's with the best po' boys. They were when I lived there. And I haven't lived in Baton Rouge since 1984. So there's probably some new ones around. Well, well that'll be, there we go. So we have yes. some uh, instant research on the screen. I was going to say uh, homework for the, the audience to see if those places still exist and go give them your business. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, here's my last question. What are you reading? I am reading a set of books called Switchblade Magazine. And it is about, it's a collection of short stories and it's in its 14th, 13th volume uh, in a type of crime fiction known as noir, N-O-I-R. And noir is mainly about people who were born behind the eight ball and through their own bad decisions and dumb luck, end up, <laughs> despite all their opportunities, making life a lot worse for themselves. <laughs> uh, and I'm trying to learn some specific techniques from reading uh, all of these noirish books because some of the characters that I want to work on in forthcoming books are people who had a chance to make things right and didn't. Mm. And it has to feel credible. It has to feel real. So I'm studying awesome. noir fiction. Okay. So maybe we'll expect to see a little bit of noir influence in your upcoming writing then. Yeah. Oh, and I, I, I also read my own first two books for this interview because <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> My memory is so bad. I didn't want you to ask me a question about it, and I would have to scratch my head. Uh, like, who was that? You know. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about the page two twenty four. If you could remember, just based on page number, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, I have everything cross indexed by that. <laughs> awesome. Well, do you have any parting comments before we close up the interview today? It was certainly uh, awesome to talk with you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on as an interview guest. It's been great to be with you. It's good to see you again. I met Ben when I was at Read It Again a couple of years ago doing an in-store event. And uh, I was just thrilled when I knew that you would be doing the interview, fellow Baton Rougean. Uh, thank you for having me on. It's been good to be with you. And it's been good to see you. And Kim, thank you for inviting me to do this. Uh, I've just had the best time. And to everyone out there who was listening and asked questions, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. This is what really makes it all worthwhile is the ability to connect with people uh, who are uh, readers. Uh, that's the whole point of doing it for me. It never gets old. I love it more than anything, any job I've ever had. So thank you for giving me this chance. Awesome. Well, these interviews, or this interview, uh, as all of the Read It Again interviews, We'll live on forever on YouTube, so feel free to stop by your own interview and see what kind of questions and comments people may have for you over the years uh, as they stumble upon this interview and watch it. So, Well, I, I can help them stumble. If you'll send me a link to it, I'll put it up on social media. We'll do that. In fact, uh, the link is probably already there. I think anyone who's watching this on YouTube right now, that link will work for uh, the replay of this in addition to it being the live. And yes, Roger's books are in stock. We hope that you will go out and support Roger by buying his books. River of Secrets and Dark River Rising and any other books that he may be coming out with soon. And of course, when you buy a book, we hope that you support your favorite independent bookstore. It doesn't yeah, have yeah. to be Read It Again books here in Swanee, Georgia, but it would be great if it were. Thank Indeed. you, everyone, for watching. And Roger, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It was a pleasure, and I look forward to meeting you again one day in person. But if not, 
over the computer. <laughs> Likewise. Amen to everything you said, Ben. Thanks again. All right. Good to be Thanks. with you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.